In spring 2006, I set off from Hong Kong on a bicycle heading for England. I'd worked in Hong Kong for several years and I'd loved it, but now I was 37 and single and my parents were getting older and I had no family within 6,000 miles. So after mulling things over a lot, I decided it was time to go home. And I thought I'd love to do the long journey back home slowly by bike. And then just when I was dreaming about cycling to London, the company I worked for said they wanted me to move back to England. So I asked for four and a half months unpaid leave, which was kind of cheeky, but after some negotiation, I got the time off. I was ecstatic. I planned my route kind of roughly using paper maps, which was pretty much what we had back then. I tried to be clear what the weather would be like. I worked out how to get the visas I needed, guessing the dates when I would cross borders. Friends helped me set up charity fundraising to try and do something good as well as enjoy the journey. I talked to my GP and took various medications for the things we thought might go wrong. I did some self-defence and street smart training. I took a tent, a tiny stove, a Kodak camera, two mobile phones and a bird book. Hong Kong meant a lot to me. I was inspired to go there because my father went there as a young working man, actually. <laughs> when I was a girl in Manchester, I met his Hong Kong Chinese friends and that made me curious, really curious, and made me want to learn Chinese. I'd done a degree in Chinese and a PhD in Chinese history and then moved to live and work in Hong Kong. And now I had loads of lovely friends of my own. It was really hard to leave. All the planning and preparations had been super hectic. Once I was on the way, I felt so happy. It's been really windy. I've had it in my face pretty much all day. So I've made quite slow progress. Really slow, with the wind howling against it. I rode across the Pearl River Delta, huge expanses of houses and factories and waterways shining in the sun. I crossed flat, Paddy fields where a hot wind blew hard. It's Wednesday morning, I think it's the 12th of April. The scenery is really interesting, it's quite beautiful. There's hardly any traffic. And the only thing is it's so really windy that I don't really like too much. So Altogether, the journey was about 11,000 kilometres. I wanted to have time to stop and talk and look around, so I aimed for about 80 kilometres a day on average, not pushing it at all. I hoped that I'd get to London on time for work in September. So now I left the Pearl River Delta and headed into the hills of South China. I was having problems with the bike actually, mainly punctures and struggling a bit generally. I'm in a small village in the northern part of Guangxi province. To be honest, it's just been quite uh, demanding getting used to how to keep body, soul and bike together on the road. Anyway, I'm going to sit and enjoy my coffee and then I will try and hit the road by about 9.30. I'm now on the road, it's about 11 o'clock, it's incredibly quiet, there's almost nothing on the road. I'm moving up this river, which I don't know the name of yet. I'm now having a mini biscuit break, it's just started to rain a little bit.
it's I think 27th of April. It's beautiful, it's very tough. Today I've been climbing for 20 kilometers non-stop since breakfast. Fortunately, I was just in time for when the baker arrived at the first village that I came to. So I bought two donuts and then two more, and then two more. Hi on Lagal Mountain, I crossed over the watershed, leaving Southeast China behind me. The rivers from now on flowed north down to the Yangtze. Alone in the rain, I shouted a last goodbye to my life in Hong Kong. So I stayed in the city of Guiyang for a week because I was really ill with food poisoning. When I was recovering, I went to find the city's amazing Catholic church somehow ended up in the choir and was invited to a wedding. I was weak after my illness and unsure whether I was actually okay or not to go, but finally I left the city and rode up towards southwest China's Yunnan Guizhou Plateau. I'm in a small village at a funeral. There's an altar set up with the photo of the lady who's died. I'm gathering rather a big crowd, so I'm going to carry on. crossed out of Guizhou into Sichuan province. Southern Sichuan was sunny and it seemed like Switzerland. I'm in a tea house. You can see here we are. Um, in the People's Park. Um, it's Sunday and there are old people, young people. I left the city children. and rode across the Chengdu plain. I passed a fantastic mosque and listened to evening prayer. Then suddenly the road went uphill. I was heading now up onto the eastern edge of the Tibetan plateau. This felt like a frontier now. The people were Qiang, which is a minority related to Tibetans and Tibetans. People told me how big and dangerous Tibetan dogs were, so I followed their advice and bought chaps and I looped spanners onto a rope to drag along the road, which the dogs apparently hate, and which I could swing and hit any dog with that attacked me. I was out of breath now all the time. The altitude was getting to me.
I was trying to reach the high grasslands, but the road was a track and really hard going. I had eaten with these road workers in their big tent, but I had a gigantic headache and I felt like I could hardly breathe. I struggled on doing only pin steps. And then I decided I couldn't manage anymore and pitched my tent in the daytime and lay down. And I dimly realized that I had altitude sickness. I lay for a while and then with my last energy, I hitched a lorry back down the hill and I was ill for several days, throwing up and all sorts. It was now the end of May. I was pretty far behind schedule and I decided to get a bus from Lanzhou and pick Dunhuang as a destination. The road had been horrific and on top of that people in Dunhuang told me that there were desert bandits on the section ahead. So I took another bus up to the Yunqi. Now I was quite far off course actually and on the wrong side of the mountains of heaven. To get to the Taklimakan Desert and Kashgar I now had to cross the mountains. I was a bit worried about altitude sickness but I didn't think it'd be that hard. of Kui Hua, some kind of flower. And next to me is, this is Xiang, a beekeeper. Dipping this bread into a huge pot of honey and I have no idea where I'm going to put it, but anyway, I'm going to enjoy it very much. But I've been riding for two hours through the rain and finally the sun has come out. It really is cold in the rain, it is freezing. I've got my paracetamol and my something else beginning with A. I set to something uh, handy. The next village was about 20 kilometers on the other side of the do a pass which went over 4,000 meters. Um, actually I had to do the whole thing walking in the end because the road turned out to be gravel and uh, it was getting extremely snowy and then icy and as the evening got colder so there was more and more ice on the road. Anyway, I reached the top of the pass and the view from the, the road top was absolutely stunning. I've never seen anything so amazing. Snow mountains just going off into forever. However, what I realised at the top of the pass, just before the top of the pass actually, was that my brakes had frozen. I did manage to free the levers but um, the rims were completely iced so that as I was braking I had no braking effects at all. Anyway, I arrived at 2am and checked into the tiny little guest house here. The bloke gave me a lot of trouble wanting to see passports and so on. I managed to get him to let me stay. And anyway, now it's the following morning and I just had to go to the police station and they won't let me stay. It's been incredibly different. I've never seen anything like this behind me here, which is 
to the south is the Taklamakan Desert and now I really see what desert is like. There was a sandstorm and I was running out of time to reach the border so I couldn't wait and took a bus to Kashgar. I had to work out now how to cross the border out of China. It was really difficult to get information about which, if any, of the passes out of China were passable by bike. It seemed that I couldn't ride up the Taragat Pass, which is what I'd hoped to do. So my only chance was the Irkashtam to the southwest, close to the Tajik border which would be a longer way round but I hoped it would work. This is the road heading west into Kyrgyzstan. Actually just now it was tipping down with rain and rocks had huge waterfalls just pouring off the top of them. That's the Horogat in the distance which is not where I'm going. I've just climbed up a, a long gradual drag. I found my heart. I found my heart. Look, here we are, a downhill, thank God. It's just been really hard, actually. I've been doing 10 kilometers an hour pretty much all day. It's hard to be this real. We can play our favorite song, dance into it all along with you, I feel. Well, I'm getting quite close to these massive mountains. There's a huge headwind. Well, this is what it looks like at the border, which I finally reached. I didn't actually realise I was there. This is a little town called Chihuahua or something like that. And it turns out it's the border. I suddenly felt really sad to leave China after all these years. After I crossed the border, I had to ride about 70 kilometres to a small settlement and it started to sleet and it was a track. My gear was just not good enough for these kinds of conditions. I hitched a track and made it to Bosch. And I was really struggling now because of course I didn't speak the language. I had a lot of trouble ordering this, uh, but I've got a salad and it's lovely to have salad. There are kind of beds to it's absolutely lovely. But I had more problems with my route. The Uzbek authorities refused my visa application. So the whole plan to go through Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan had to be scrapped. And I decided I would try a northern route through Kazakhstan. It's hard to be, it's hard to be this real. We can play our favorite song. It turned out that guest houses here and hotels were either derelict or completely shut down. Last night, the hotel, which was supposed to be in the little town, turned out not to be working, so I cycled through a thunderstorm, a bit worrying, um, but I knew it would pass over, so it passed over, and when it passed over, I camped by the side of the road. A delicious breakfast. I've got some tea and some bread and uh, some orange juice, which is a little bit strange, but absolutely lovely breakfast.
So it's about the 5th of July and I've been riding through Kazakhstan which has been absolutely lovely. I'm camping quite a lot and at first I was a bit anxious about the whole thing to be honest but <clears throat> so far I'm in touch wood. It's turning out to be quite okay. Some Kazakh herders just went by. <clears throat> there are birds just zooming. I don't know where they're all going but they're just zooming <coughs> in great flocks along the river. Yeah some Kazakh blokes just went by on horses and they just wave hello and I think they have a I hope they don't worry too much about people camping by rivers. This land was actually part of the Silk Road and Otra was a Silk Road city. The place is absolutely baked by the sun, it's about 40 degrees. My God, it's just absolutely desolate. Well, it's Sunday, the uh, 9th of July, and I don't really know where I am. I've been cycling all morning, it's now nearly three o'clock, and I've done about 40k, which is nothing, because there's a huge headwind, which is driving me bananas. I've only just got enough water, I think, to get to Turkestan, and uh, I'm just gonna, I just, I just don't exactly know where I am, because this road wasn't on the map. And I've just come to the side, which I don't understand. The step is a lot harder than the desert, and there's nobody here. There are no villages. It's really tough. I have been welcomed by a group of holiday makers from Almaty who are travelling to the Black Sea and they are uh, planning a song to sing. And, uh, so, here we go. It's Thursday afternoon on the 20th of July and I'm on the beach, right by the waves of the Caspian Sea. I've come down to the beach really to say goodbye to Central Asia. I've been waiting for the, a ferry to Azerbaijan, but it turns out that the ferry does not depart for another week. I found that out today after three days. I can't really waste another week. Azerbaijan, about 30 kilometers west of Baku. So I'm now heading towards a place called Samarha, but I'm not going to reach it for another couple of days, so I'm going to have to sleep out somewhere tonight. It is very windy as well, so I'm not quite sure how this will Once again, I had to work out in a new place how to survive. hotels were collapsing here too. I actually stayed in this hotel. I had cheerful company but on the top of a climb one day I heard running footsteps and I turned thinking I must have dropped something and someone was trying to help me but a man was now trying to grab me. I managed to sprint away but I was really shaken. And then there were other challenges. The river kind of came onto the road and the road was all washed away. So by the time I arrived in Sheki I looked 
like I'd been dragged through a bog backwards or forwards, I don't know. I crossed into Georgia and suddenly there were villas with shady trellises and grapevines and the beautiful blue mountains of the Great Caucasus behind. Unfortunately, in Tbilisi, I was raped by a policeman whom I'd approached for directions and who seemed kind. I sat in the quiet churches of George's holy city for a whole day, crying, <laughs> and then pedalled away through the Golden Hills. I crossed into Turkey and found myself climbing the huge mountains of eastern Anatolia, struggling in high winds, but it was super beautiful. Well, it's the morning of the 12th of August and I'm in a garage, actually. I'm staying in a room of a garage. I was hoping to get to Trebizond on the Black Sea coast in about a week, but it took me much longer. It's all notions of our emotions, of everything we are. And this bus driver and his wife had me to stay. I gave my bike horn to Suleiman, their son, when I left, and I could hear him tooting it as I rode away across the valley. Fly with courage and bravado, fly with passion in our hearts, and reliance in the power of love will guide us safe to shore. So I have finally reached the Black Sea. It's been a really hard two weeks, it's much harder than I I've been riding every day for the last 14 days. I rode west along the coast with the sound of the waves and the smell of seaweed on hot rocks on the shore. Today I've done about 90k, it's been quite easy. The road is mostly flat, it just kind of glides along. But the coast road was narrow and kind of crumbling at the edges and full of big container lorries. It felt really dangerous actually, so I turned inland again. We're caught in burning fire, almost falling from the sky. And the sun may tear the wings of us like Icarus. We fly, fly with courage and bravado, fly with passion in our hearts. climb back up over the mountains and return to the sea. Really windy and I think I'm going to get it in my face when I turn the next bend. But anyway, it's a beautiful day. I came not only into wind but rain. When I got to the coast I found it was wild and empty. A narrow road pitches up and down along its fringe. It's beautiful, but very hard. I'm in a small cafe. It's kind of homely, really. It feels very European. And then when I look around, I remember cafes in China. And in many ways, it's... Finally, about 400 kilometres from Istanbul, the going got easier. I've come down to a tiny little cove on the western Black Sea shore. I've spent the whole day slightly inland crossing mountains and then uh, doing some quite easy bits along the sea where it's been flat. And then I saw a sign for some bungalows and cattle for you, which I think means holiday village. 
so I decided I would aim for it and it turned out to be absolutely lovely. It's the only thing is it's only me here. <laughs> so it's a bit lonely. Turkey had been fabulous. Men had been kind but they'd hassled me all the way. Not frightening, but it was just exhausting to face constant questioning. Where is your husband? Why are you alone? Some of the nicest people to be with had actually been children. Finally, I arrived in Istanbul. It was now September and I was far behind my plan. My work, kindly agreed to extend my unpaid leave. So now I had six weeks to ride 3,000 kilometres before the end of October, about 80 kilometres a day, every day. I decided to head through the former Eastern Bloc, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, places that I hadn't seen. I replaced my shredded tyres and I set out across Thrace. I'm riding along the coast of the Marmara Sea. This is the last sea that I will see until I reach the English Channel. Some days were still hot, but the weather was changing and it felt like autumn was around the corner now. I've just crossed the border into Bulgaria. It's been raining all morning actually, I'm a bit wet that it stopped ish. Finishing off a cup of tea that I've made. I've got one pan with me and then um, I've got bread and bits and bobs in this, in this bag. Um, and I normally do this for lunch at the moment because it saves time, you can just quickly um, have what you want, make a quick tea or coffee, a Nescafe, and, um, and then go on. I was so excited about arriving in Europe. It probably doesn't look like much, but this is actually very exciting because I am just having my first proper coffee. Europe is just going to be great. Across the Danube, into Romania, and then I rode north through the Carpathians. I've just arrived in the great plain of Hungary, and it's actually lovely. The road is um, beautifully smooth, and um, you can hear the rustling in the trees of the wind. It's a really strong wind, actually. But hopefully it's gonna be behind me. I'm going up to a town called Debrecen, or something like that, which is about 50 kilometers. The wind was against me. I battled for two days between wild yellow grasses tossing in the wind. Sometimes these days, I suddenly felt really lonely. I'd look back at the road that I'd just ridden and see that it was empty and I, and that made me feel lonely. And I'd sit sometimes for a moment, finishing a cup of tea somewhere, and it just felt like I could see myself, like a tiny person in this huge landscape, and it, it was lonely. I stayed in Budapest for two days, and I met these two. I did meet a few more cyclists here, but it was odd here in this comfortable, smooth landscape. I could hardly explain what I had seen. In Germany, I felt strange with my muddy bags, drinking coffee in clean petrol stations. In Holland, my friend Andrea's husband rode the last day in Europe with me into The Hague. So I'd ridden about 10,000 kilometres and I was so nearly home. I crossed the North Sea, 
feeling kind of strange and sad. I rode across Essex and arrived in London and the next day I started my new job. 